This podcast is brought to you by Custom Plan Financial Advisors, Inc., an independent insurance managing general agency in Canada. Financialpodcast.ca was developed with one goal in mind, to educate Canadians on important topics that affect their financial well-being and make it readily available to all. We welcome you to plug in and learn with us. If you have questions, please email us at contact at financialpodcast.ca. Good day, everyone. At the time of this recording, we are one week into 2021, so I wish you all a very happy new year. Insurance is a fairly broad term that encompasses many different pieces. One of those pieces that is so important is the need for business insurance. Having been a small business owner myself, I have a very basic understanding of this potentially complex product. So today we have with us Paul Vanderhoeft of Westland Insurance to break it down. Now for full disclosure, the insurance that my husband and I have is through Westland. And this was due to Westland's purchase of an independent broker's business in Carstairs, Alberta. We'd originally had our insurance through Ironside Insurance until Westland purchased them last year. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for being on the show. You are the go-to guy for business insurance, but can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background in Westland? Well, absolutely, Darlene. Thanks for having me. And uh, and as you mentioned, Happy New Year to you and uh, all of the people listening in. Pleasure to be joining you today. Yeah, a little bit about myself. I um, like probably a lot of your your listeners i'm a, a married father of with a couple of children i graduated more years ago than i care to count from uh, from the university of manitoba with a, a business degree from the the asper school of business i started in the industry as an underwriter with Wawanisa mutual insurance a uh, a name that's quite familiar on the personal and business insurance um, landscape in alberta for sure and across the country so it's a personal insurance broker, primarily home and auto insurance for the fi- first five years of my insurance broker career. And for the last 15 years, I've been a commercial insurance broker. And for the last three, almost four now, have been managing the commercial insurance team in Southern Alberta here in Lethbridge, uh, which is where my office is located. What I've accomplished personally, professionally in the insurance industry is uh, I, I have obtained both my Canadian accredited insurance broker and chartered insurance professional designations. I do you know, maintain a significant amount of continuing education every year as well. Recently uh, was the past president of the Insurance Brokers Association of Alberta and currently sit as the uh, director for Alberta on the Insurance Brokers Association of Canada board. Yeah. And as far as Westland Insurance goes, this is Westland Insurance 40th year in business, primarily a Western-based broker for the last 35 years or so. The company has started moving eastward and just recently completed acquisitions that now make us a full national broker with offices coast to coast, just recently adding Quebec and Nova Scotia to our mix. So exciting times for us in our business and uh, lots of businesses in lots of communities to help going forward. At least that's our plan. So we're, you know, over 150 communities that we have offices in, close to 1,700 employees. And um, we're ready to to rock and roll and and help everybody out where we can. That's excellent. And I I have to say you're the second former Manitoban that I've interviewed. I'm also from Manitoba, so, you know, I pick up on these things. Uh, so it's it's always nice meeting an expat in these situations. There we go. <laughs> well, and, and we're also friendly, right? And that's so. right, right. That's what everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> there we go. So what are some of the advantages, first of all, of using an insurance broker? Probably the best thing to do to answer that question is to is to kind of start by explaining the difference between various sales roles in in insurance. There are three primary types. There are insurance brokers, which is how Westland Insurance approaches business. There are insurance agents, which typically are 
They operate very similarly to brokers. However, they represent only one insurance company. Um, so that would be an agent from, a, say, a, a cooperators or an Allstate or, or something along those lines. And then there's direct sales. So there are insurance companies that have, you know, marketing centers that directly deal with insurance or, or with, with clients, you know, through, through phone and email and call center based type um, scenario. And again, those are typically scenarios where that individual works only for that one insurance company. So an insurance broker, while being a sales professional on the insurance side, is is also more of an advisor from the sense that we're aware of multiple products and have access to providing solutions using multiple products to, um, to help out business owners. So um, that can be having a, a, an insurance package through... Or, or getting quotes from multiple insurance companies for the same commercial package, or it could mean using multiple insurance companies to develop an insurance program for a single client where different lines of coverage are provided by different carriers. So brokers have access, generally speaking, to to more products, uh, more services, and, and a, a broader ability to collaborate with customers to put together an insurance program that's suitable and customizable to them. In addition to representing those multiple insurance companies, we also are able to, in a more meaningful way, advocate for the client at claims time. We are not employees of the insurance company. We are more, in a sense, employees of the client. We are you know, we represent the client to the companies and therefore we can advocate when when the rubber hits the road and a, and a claim uh, presents itself. In a lot of cases, insurance brokers go down the risk management path and provide a lot of risk management um, services and advice to clients as well that uh, sometimes is, is missed by some of the other insurance professionals out there. Yeah, and I think that's, that's probably a, a good overall outline of, of what an insurance broker is and does that makes them a little bit different than some of the other professionals out there. Yeah, and I I can tell you that we've probably dealt with every different kind of insurance player, for lack of a better word, you know, the, the agent, the call center, the, like so institutional insurance, and most recently with an independent broker. So, so for us, it's we, we've seen all the different levels of service and I by far have a greater appreciation of the independent insurance broker. I sometimes feel sorry for you, but I have a greater <laughs> appreciation. Well, there's maybe a little bit of uh, a little bit of illness <laughs> to, to, before you get involved in this business. It can be uh, it can be quite uh, quite a daunting task sometimes to to keep on on top of everything. But. Well, yeah, and especially now, and that sort of is is a nice segue into my next question because especially in starting in 2020, there would have been a lot of businesses that would have gone from a bricks and mortar location to working outside or, or within their home. So how, how do you determine like the difference, the different products you can offer like a home-based business versus a small business? And what are some of those differences? Well, you know, that's an, that's an interesting question. And probably one of the, the biggest misconceptions about business insurance is that a business run from your home is a home-based business. A home-based business in, you know, insurance language is is something different. It, it's typically insurance underwriters typically would consider a home-based business to be one that is dealing in, you know, very small production of of handicrafts or growing small amounts of produce for a farmer's market or or something along those lines where there's fairly low volume of revenue generated by the business and very limited amount of you know business contents and equipment and tools that are needed to run the business and no real need for an office presence where customers can come visit them so if you if you fall into that category then in a lot of times you can talk to your your personal home insurance provider and they can endorse onto your house insurance policy an extension for a home based business exposure you know, some of the ones that I've dealt with in the past are, like I said, some of those handicrafts, you know, making decorative candles, you know, providing, you know, back in the day when it was new, 
you know, gluten free and dairy free baking and, and those types of things to to sell at, at markets. You know, and, and so some of those types of things that are are not necessarily real commercial by nature. Businesses, on the other hand, that are run from home and are simply just transitioned from home because we've got a home office and we're talking, you know, business consultants and people that they may still have a bricks and mortar shop, but they have a number of people throughout their city or country or whatever the case may be that are working from a home-based office because they just need access to a laptop and a cell phone. You know, we, we would approach those similarly to a business that has a full bricks and mortar set up and they still need the same requirements. What the, the difference is, is just making sure the insurance companies know how that business is set up and that there are, you know, individual employees that may have, you know, small amounts of, you know, business materials and so forth in their home. You know, and, and then the other piece is just to make sure we are aware of whether or not those those professionals are are entertaining clients in their home or or if it's simply an office where yeah, you know, and, and they they conduct their business off premises by going to visit their clients as opposed to their clients coming to them. So those those are the things that we that we kind of drill down to, and then from there, then we just have a standard standard conversation with the business owner about what their business actually is and does. Okay, so if it's if it's more like a hobby as opposed to a primary income, there's then you can probably just add on to your home insurance. Is that what you're saying? But if it is more like a you know, a business that has is just operating from the house because that's the way it, it works and it's and it's somebody's primary income, then you consider that to be more of a small business. Have I got that understanding correct? Yeah, that would be largely the case. You know, not every house insurance provider offers a an extension for a home based business either. And so in some cases, you know, those micro businesses, maybe as we call them, would still require a, a, a standard business insurance package because they can't get an extension. And and also some businesses, hobby or not, are are riskier than others. And so, you know, you may be a hobby shop welder in your garage, but um, you're probably not getting a home based extension for, for having a welding shop. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> So what should a small business owner consider when they're thinking about their insurance needs? You know, there, there's a number of areas that are very dependent on the size and scope of the business. But for the most part, insurance policies for businesses are kind of broken down into four or five major parts. And, and a commercial insurance package typically you have know, your property insurance so coverage for your your various business contents which would be your furniture fixtures equipment other office equipment perhaps some some inventory stock customer goods if you're a business that brings customer goods back to your shop to work on them you know and, and those types of other tools and mobile equipment if, if you're a service provider that runs service trucks you may have tools and equipment parts and accessories that are that are on the road with you to go from job to job so there's all that property type coverage there's business interruption coverage of course um, for scenarios where your business is shut down due to the operation of of apparel on those on that property then Probably the most important coverage for all businesses is their general liability insurance coverage. That is the coverage there for, you know, whatever allegations of um, bodily injury or property damage that, that you may be alleged to have caused to, you know, customers or other members of the general public just by operating your business. And, and then also some some contractual liability obligations that could be that could happen there for failure to deliver on a contract and those types of things. And then businesses that have vehicles, of course, those, those businesses have automobile insurance exposures and that are different than your personal auto insurance exposures. And so you may have a small business and you may think, well, I already have my vehicle insured and I'm just using the same vehicle. It's important for the insurance companies to know what you are using your vehicle for. So, you know, if if you've got the minivan that you normally run around, run the kids around in and everything else, but, you know, when they're in school and everything else, you're running your business and you're running to the bank and visiting clients and carrying supplies back and forth and, and so forth, that, that changes the exposure and how insurance companies look at things. So you've definitely got to understand that as well. And 
And of course, there are some businesses whose money is made by uh, having a vehicle. So whether it's a small business owner that has, you know, one or two taxis in the town, which is quite common in, in especially in smaller centers, or you know that um, that trucker that does does local deliveries or long haul deliveries, or, or you own a fleet of buses. All all of these different things are there. And then there's a whole host of other specialty coverages that can come up depending on the type of of business you are and organization, not for profit organizations have some different things that they that they require specialists in business that have specialized training, thinking doctors, lawyers, accountants, and a lot of those professionals have other professional liability exposures that are separate and need their own coverage as well. So lots of things to think about and that's um, and going through that's part of the you know dealing with an insurance broker and, and why why you want to to find a good one and and go through the, all of that stuff with them. Yeah, I mean that's that's fairly extensive, but there's there's a couple of things I'd like to revisit here. Um sure. when you were talking about perils, like what is considered a peril? So typically uh, for property insurance a peril is going to be those things that can cause physical damage to the property that you have insured. So in a basic sense we're talking about you know, wind, hail, fire, flood, those types of things. The, the similar types of perils that you would have on your house insurance thing. The, the perils don't really change. There may be more or less perils included in a policy depending on the level of coverage you buy. But that's generally what's meant by when I refer to perils. Okay. So now, because this is this has probably come up a lot for you, I know I've seen it around on, on social media, But there have been a fair number of businesses that have been shut down for extended periods of time with COVID-19. Does this business interruption coverage cover that sort of shutdown? Generally speaking, no. And, And the reason it doesn't is because the presence of a virus or the government choosing to uh, warn people off of keeping their businesses open and so forth doesn't present a physical damage to any of their business property. And business interruption is triggered by that physical damage to the property. So, you know, there are, I will say it's not a blanket no, because there are specialized programs out there, you know, for industry, certain types of industry groups that, that are predisposed to this type of um, exposure that have negotiated specialized terms for for their groups. But probably 99% of, of standard commercial insurance package policies would not respond to COVID-19 from a business interruption perspective. Okay, yeah. So it, it, it does refer to, or it, most of the policies refer to physical damage, you know, the a pipe bursts or, you know, there's a small electrical fire or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. That That's understandable. So what does affect insurance pricing? Because sometimes it, it seems like the, um, you know, premiums are, you know, fairly reasonable, then they jump up and then they go back down. And so it's, it can be hard sometimes to understand how pricing is calculated. Yeah. So, you know, in most people are familiar with their personal home and auto insurance or tenants package, or maybe they own a condo unit and they're pretty comfortable with understanding that if they have, if they have a claim, their insurance premium may go up for the following, following renewal or, you know, on the auto insurance side, you know, not necessarily a claim, but suddenly they're, you know, have two or three traffic tickets where previously they had none. And, and so, you know, underwriters look at that information as that, which would, you know, trend towards a, a you know, an imminent uh, scenario, risky behavior that could lead to claim scenarios. And so there's surcharges and, and so forth there. When it comes to commercial insurance, commercial auto insurance, there's a lot of similarities to personal auto insurance as far as the pricing structure. So I wouldn't spend too much time diving into that. But on the property and liability side for insurance companies, they spend a lot more time dealing with on the property side, the nature and construction of the premises that you occupy, whether you own the building or not, you know, how predisposed is this building to, to say a fire loss? You know, is it a a concrete building versus a wood frame building? You know, how old is the building? Is it 
you know, getting close to the point where it may be prone to those water pipe bursts because the infrastructure in the building is, you know, 30 years old instead of three years old. So some of those things will definitely affect insurance pricing. Geographical location, insurance companies are getting more and more sophisticated with um, with how they price based on where a property is located, where your business is located. You know, it used to be the building is in Lethbridge. And so, you know, it's this kind of price price range versus one that's in Calgary or, you know, all other things being equal. But now it's getting to the point where, you know, with postal code driven rating, they're getting right down to, you know, what, how many, you know, how many square blocks of, of an area are you in? And do we know that this area hasn't had, or the, the city hasn't yet updated all of their critical infrastructure uh, and so forth? And they, they dive deeper and deeper into the data. And so it gets harder and harder to understand where some of that rating information comes from. But we still deal with it largely the same way as far as, you know, what is your, what exposures do you have? What's the construction? What's the occupancy? What, uh, what perils are you likely to be subject to? What other exposures do you have from uh, your customers, from your neighbors, from the community at large that you're in? And that all kind of determines the pricing. And then we, you know, we offset some of that pricing by, you know, instituting deductibles. You know, higher deductibles generally mean, you know, lower pricing to a point. You know, at a certain certain point, insurance companies look at deductibles as a reason to be comfortable with a risk rather than to to discount something. And so so there, there's lots that go into that. And then obviously as you move forward, your claims activity is always going to determine what types of rates you're going to see. Right. You could set a base rate and then the insurance company is going to apply, you know, charges and credits to your overall risk profile based on on how you behave and and also to some degree what type of business operation you're in. You know, you can have an office exposure in a frame building or you could, you know, be a dynamite manufacturer in a frame building and the pricing is going to be different. Yeah. Yeah. As as right? really it should be. <laughs> <laughs> well you would hope, right? <laughs> So I mean that so that's largely on the property side. On the liability side, it's all about it's all about overall size of your operation and what type of operation you're in. The insurance company kind of has base rates set on all kinds of um, industry classifications. And so if if you're a you know a candle maker versus a church versus a you know corner convenience store or a welder shop or an auto dealer, you all have different base rates that you start from. And then they go from there based on overall size of business, usually figured on a couple of different factors, you know, the, the overall square footage of the of your business, if it's a if it's a real estate holding company kind of operation or gross revenues, if it is, you know, pretty much any other type of business, number of employees, you know, and, and those types of things to determine the, the size. And then of course the risky na- nature of the business is are you producing a product that has inherent risks to it. You know, are you a manufacturer of bicycles or are you simply, you know, selling, you know, bolts of, you know, uncut cloth, right? Very different exposures and have different factors uh, involved. And also, are you selling into the U.S. or outside of country? Those typically add significant um, considerations to the liability pricing as well. And then claims activity, again. So just to to talk about that for a moment, why would it make a difference if you're selling your product outside the country? Insurance companies are very well acquainted with the jurisdictions in which they operate. So they know how to handle the claims. They have a network of you know adjusters and other industry professionals, whether it's contractors or body shops or you know, other professional services that they may need for, say, a business interruption claim, like, you know, forensic accountants and and those types of professionals. They have a great network of all of those people when they're in their own country. When they go into other countries, then they have to, the costs associated for them of of finding those appropriate individuals and and vetting them and making sure, of course, that all increases because it's not not entirely a one-off scenario, but it's certainly... They've got less less volume, and so they got to deal with that. And and then also having to navigate the, especially on the liability side, that navigate the the rules and regulations and legislation and everything that might apply in a different country to this loss that are different 
then. And sometimes having to transfer, in fact, a lot of times having to transfer insurance claims back to the home jurisdiction from where it occurred and, and making sure that a claim that happened you know, in Texas is actually dealt with in Alberta, where the business owner you know, has their home base. So, so lot, lots of additional factors. And generally speaking, the U.S. would be one of the um, one of the most expensive places to be doing business. And unfortunately, that is a, a very close neighbor. So there's lots of Canadians that are Canadian businesses that have uh, regular exposure to that. But the U.S. is a very litigious society and uh, almost a, you know, sue first, ask and ask questions and negotiate later kind of scenario. And so that makes uh, that makes it a challenge, too, because you're you're going to court right away as opposed to trying to work things out on a, uh, you know, on a more understanding basis that that can avoid all of those extra costs associated with with court. Yeah, so that's really something to consider for a business owner. And if an insurance broker is dealing with an in, a business owner, understanding the additional costs if they do go outside of Canada, because I'm, I'm sure there's probably other countries that it's very similar situation as in Canada. Like if, if somebody were to send their products to, to the UK, for instance, I, I would imagine the UK is not as different from Canada as Canada is from the U.S. in this regard. It, would that be correct? That would be more often than not the case. Where we see issues other than the U.S. And, and the U.S. has a lot of similarities to Canada as far as you know how they how they arrive at their decisions when it comes to liability and who's at fault for what. But it's just a, a scenario where you know ev- everybody seems to be kind of at that liability trough as you know looking more as a, a liability lawsuit as a potential for a windfall as opposed to a, a means to resolve a dispute. And so that certainly becomes a, a bigger issue outside of the, you know, generally speaking, we kind of talk about Canada, US and rest of the world. And um, when we're dealing with the rest of the world, there are those countries, like you mentioned, the UK, really anywhere in Western Europe, you know, New Zealand, Australia, a number of those types of countries that operate very similarly to Canada, primarily because most of those countries have all at one point or another been born out of, you know, the British Empire. And so we all have very similar laws and and everything in that way, right? When you get into Asia and some of the Eastern European countries, the laws there are very, very different as well, but they're a lot less sophisticated. And so Depending on what you're on, what type of business you're in, it may or may not present challenges. You know, manufacturers that manufacture large amounts of, you know, say, say furniture or those types of things, and that or food products, and they bring those back into, you know, they outsource the manufacturing to China, for instance, and they bring bring it back in and sell it. It's a challenge, you know, if there's a defect in in a product that's because of the manufacturing process. It's really hard to go after that Chinese manufacturer as the responsible party. And so the Canadian manufacturer distributor, even though they didn't physically produce the product, they take on all of the responsibility because the insurance company has nobody to go back after. And so there's that is part of the issue as well is, is can you push responsibility upon the actual party that's responsible or, or do you as the business owner unfortunately take it on simply because of you know, the laws of the land in which you've chosen to do business. Yeah, so they, they've got to weigh the risks of doing business in those countries where they may not get some sort of restitution or, you know, have difficulties in this area. They they weigh the risks. They'll have to, you know, that, that would definitely have to be a consideration when yeah, expanding. It's, it's, in- it's something that we talk with clients about all the time, you know, our, especially like in, in Lethbridge, we're an hour and a half from the U.S. border. So it you know, every every business owner in along Highway One in Canada is pretty much looking at an opportunity to can we expand into the U.S. You know, and and how what would that look like? And, and in a lot of cases, it's a lot more expensive to do so than one might think. Keeping in mind, of course, that insurance is only one of their overhead items, but it is it's definitely an impactful one. So they do have to have that conversation. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we've sort of talked about those claim situations. What What is the role of the broker in a claim situation? We mentioned it earlier. It's it's really 
uh, at least for us here at Westland and, and in other places that I've worked for in the past, it's always been about advocacy. You know, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our clients to ensure that when an insurance claim is presented, that we get as much of the of the detail and so forth as possible right from the outset to make sure that the claim is presented well to the insurance company so that their adjusters have a great place to start from and good understanding of what happened. It's making sure that the client understands how the claims process is pro- most likely to unfold. There will always be bumps in the road. A claims situation, no matter how good your coverage is, a claim situation is always stressful. There's always bumps in the road. There's, you know, on both sides of a, of a claim scenario, it, it's people and people are prone to have misunderstandings and sometimes conflicts of personality and a, no, a number of things that, that make it a challenge. So the, the role of the broker is really to keep that whole process smooth, make sure information is flowing back and forth, you know, and, and when things go off the rails to try and bring it back on and, and reel it in and get it, get it moving in the right direction. But it's also to temper some expectations from time to time. You know, there are things that people want to make insurance claims for that uh, they may not have coverage for, whether because they chose not to purchase it when it was offered or it's a coverage that's just not available, or, you know, or it's a, a standard exclusion on insurance policies. Um, and so you kind of have those conversations in advance and just say, hey, you know what, from our interpretation of the policy, this may be a challenge to get coverage for or full coverage for so i just want you to be aware but you know as insurance brokers we don't we don't have the final say on that but when you know the adjusters start making the arguments about why things may not be covered as as hoped then it's our job to um, assist the client to dive into those policy wordings and make sure that the insurance company is interpreting them fairly and appropriately and see if there is you know, they may be looking at one part of the policy to make an exclusion, whereas a different part of the policy would suggest that coverage should be there. And the adjusters are not necessarily experts in every portion of a policy wording. And just like everybody else, they can learn something new on any given day. And, uh, you know, so that's kind of our role is just to kind of be that even headed approach to help the customers navigate that. Well, so, so really, you're, you're the expert partner that a customer can rely on in these types of, of situations. So that's, that's great to know. That's one of the advantage, another advantage of having a broker, right? Yeah, because, you know, we can go down that road, we can be that trusted advisor and advocate where, you know, a, a direct relationship insurance company, you know, those agents and direct sellers, they really can't because they work for the same, they work for the company that sold you the product. They, they're not, um, their interest in your well being kind of breaks down at that point. In my opinion. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be entirely unbiased. Yeah, it's just kind of the nature of, of how that type of sales approach works. And it doesn't make them bad people or bad par- business partners or any of that type of thing. It's just a different scenario that doesn't work in as well, in my opinion. So. That's right. It's just the way it is with them. So now there are, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before, but there are a lot of businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19. What are some of the considerations those businesses need to be thinking about now when it comes to insurance? Well, in the midst of it, as we continue to to navigate, you know, all of these things, you know, obviously there are businesses that are facing extended shutdowns and it seems to me the hardest hit tends to be the, the hospitality sector, you know, hotels, restaurants, um, et cetera, that, that are just, you know, not able to be open to the extent that they were. Can't keep the same types of hours, can't have the same volume of customers at any given time. You know, so th- there's a lot of challenges there, which we empathize with. Uh, we, we talk to those business customers daily throughout our organization, and I'm sure brokers right across the country would would echo that. The reality is that the insurance companies have been fairly good about you know, and they and they all approach it a little bit differently, but have been fairly good about understanding that, you know, even though there's not really a business interruption claim to be made, they understand that business is slow. They understand that, in, you know, these business owners may be struggling because of the these challenges, and so they've offered you know opportunities to readdress some of the price points in an insurance policy to make those 
a little bit easier to to stomach or to to at least give those business owners a longer period of time to ramp back up uh, when this is is over. So you know maybe while your business is is temporarily shut down, you may consider increasing your deductibles because there's you know lower chance of exposure for certain types of things or. If you were a business that normally had a million dollars in sales and now because all you can offer is take out, you're down to 250,000 in sales, you're down from 15 employees to five. You know, let's have those conversations with the insurance companies and see if we can't get that liability portion of the premium down a little bit, you know, and, and do some of those. And then some of the insurance companies have, um, you know, some of them have made you know media splashes about it and others have just gone about it quietly, but they've they've offered some rebates to policyholders that are, are particularly hard hit where it's it's not a change to the policy at all it's strict it's simply a rebate the insurance companies cut them checks and so so the industry has you know done what they can but you also have to understand that businesses that even if they're not operating at full capacity they are still they still have exposures and so the insurance policies are they can't become free unfortunately but they can certainly become less expensive and more able to accommodate the current situation. So so that's kind of how we're working on it. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's probably going to give uh, comfort to a lot of small business owners because, you know, seeing the insurance industry adapt over 2020 has probably been one of the nicest surprises that uh, that has occurred, you know, whether, whether it's been technologically or adapting their policies for these new realities for some of these businesses, it's it's encouraging to see the these insurance companies make these changes. So that's that's great. Yeah, you know, it it really has been. I think there's a public perception often that you know it's the big bad insurance company. They never want to to help out, but insurance companies really do recognize their role as a the financial safety net for the economy. So they recognize their role. They're doing what they can within the confines of, you keep in mind that they're subject to a lot of rules and regulations and, and so forth that make it harder for them to actually, in their opinion, do what's right, which is sometimes they can't just give money back for certain things and they can't just do things because regulations, you know, legislation gets in the way. And um, that's, so they're they're doing what they can to stay within that and still be uh, still be helpful and, and in some cases getting creative to be helpful and and offering um, you know other other services uh, and benefits to insurance clients that maybe they didn't have before adding some you know different you know helplines hotlines for different types of legal advice and and different things at little to no charge to clients so th- there's all kinds of things that insurance companies have been doing over the last year and even a little, and even pre-COVID to, to really start transitioning to be more helpful than not. That's really great to see. It's, it's really encouraging and it's, a, it's really a, a nice change. So now to end this off, like what are, what's some advice and recommendations that you would give to business owners, to insurance brokers? What, what sort of suggestions do you have for them? A couple of things. And, and I don't think these are necessarily just insurance things. Don't enter into a business without a plan. We see a lot of um, people who want to start businesses and, and they start businesses with very little planning. A solid business plan that contemplates you know, a number of things, including what your insurance exposures are and, and, um, and how you are going to uh, address those is, is critical. This is a big difference between success and failure. There are businesses that succeed you know, with, without a real plan or, or at least not a plan on paper. They're few and far between, and the ones that do certainly aren't generally prone to to growth, if that's what you're hoping for. You need to plan for that. Don't consider insurance after the fact. Have those risk management conversations. Insurance is really all about transferring the business owner's risk or portions of their risk from their personal pocketbook to the insurance company. So don't minimize that and don't take the attitude that insurance is just an overhead cost that I would like to avoid as long as possible. Typically, claims arise and businesses lose when they haven't purchased the coverage in advance. We can't put the horse back in the barn. We can work to help rebuild the barn when it burns down, if that analogy makes sense. You know, so, so there's lots of things there. Insurance 
professionals are just that. They are professionals. They're, they're professional advisors. They're not just salespeople. If you're dealing with an insurance professional that feels like you're just dealing with someone that's trying to push a product and make a sale, that's probably a good indication that you should maybe do a little bit more homework on on who you're um, you know entrusting with that portion of your uh, of your business exposures. The same way you may shop for and interview your accountant or your lawyer, but, you know. And then probably the third thing and, and the thing that I talk about the most with my clients is try and work to a scenario where you have your your legal counsel, your financial counsel, whether that be your accountant and your financial benefits, um, you know, all of the various components there, and your insurance broker all on the same page. Work to a consensus because when they're all on the same page, things go a whole lot more smoothly than when they're at odds because each of those professionals come at your business from with a different perspective. Accountants come, you know, on the basis of trying to make sure that your tax burden is as, as small as possible. You know, and lawyers come, you know, there to deal with a lot of the the legal transactions of, you know, buying and selling a building or setting up contracts and so forth. But they're not necessarily as concerned about, well, now that you have that contract, what does that do to your insurability? So, you know, a, a number of those things. And so it's as a business owner, get as much advice as you can from as many sources as you can, but also don't rely on your neighbor for good insurance advice. Their situation is different. There are no two situations that are the same. You may look at your, even if you lived in exactly the same cookie cutter house as your neighbor on the same block, your exposure and their exposure, what matters to you, what matters to them, what's what risk tolerance they have versus what you have. All of that is different And that is all the same in businesses. You can be a body shop owner in Lethbridge. You can be a body shop owner in Calgary. You can have basically the same business and have a very different outlook. And you shouldn't necessarily, it's not that you shouldn't talk to each other and to to see, you know, because there's lots of merit in that, but understand that the professional insurance person is the professional insurance person. The other person that owns a business similar to yours is not the professional insurance person. That's right. They're they're the professional in that business. Yeah, exactly. An insurance broker is an and definitely an important part of the, of the team for any business owner to, to rely on. Take good counsel from the right counselors. That's probably the best way to put it. That's an excellent piece of advice. And you know what? Thank you again, Paul, for being part of the program today. It sure has been enlightening for me. Can you tell us how our listeners can get in touch with you? Sure. Just in general, they can get in touch with Westland Insurance by visiting our our website, westlandinsurance.ca. From there, you can choose your. Um, I mean, it's a work in progress because we're we're growing, but from there, you can choose the you know the province that you're in and and get directed to a broker that way. You can also contact us by email in our Lethbridge office. Contact us by Lethbridge Info at westlandinsurance.ca or myself at p vanderhooft at westlandinsurance.ca i'm happy to talk to anybody anywhere almost at any time and just uh by phone 403-328-7777 gets you here in lethbridge but on our website you can find a local office with a local phone number or an 800 number that can get you directed where you need to talk lots of ways to get in touch with us and and uh more and more ways coming. <laughs> well, that's great. That's exciting, exciting news for you guys today. And, and uh, we'll have all that contact information on the website when this podcast goes up. So thank you to everyone out there. And if you have any questions or guest suggestions for us, please send an email to contact at financialpodcast.ca. And with that, I'd like to wish everyone a great day. The views expressed here are those of the participants and not those of Custom Plan Financial Advisors, Inc., its affiliates or subsidiaries. This is not intended to serve as a complete analysis of every material fact regarding any company, industry, or security. This presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Investors are cautioned not to place undue reliance on such statements, as actual results could vary. This site and podcasts are for general information purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and is not intended as an endorsement of any specific investment product or service. Individual investors should consult with an investment professional about their personal situation. 
Past performance is not indicative of future results. If you are unsure about what is the best course of action for you in your financial planning, then we suggest you consult a fee-based independent financial advisor or get in touch with us to discuss your individual situation. Our phone number is 604-687-7773.